my love and appreciation for the hymns and songs of our faith were first given to me by my grandmother Marie and my mother Dorothy. Whenever I was in their presence, it seems as though they were always singing or humming one of their favorite hymns. My grandmother would sit on her front porch. You don't hear those two words much often. She would sit on her front porch with her funeral fan. <laughs> you, oh, we know some people in here who remember that. You know, either Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane or something like that. She would sit on the front porch with her funeral fan trying to create something of a breeze. And she would rock back and forth singing and humming her favorite song. And my mother would do the same as she went about the house doing her chores. As a young boy, I, I fell under the spell and the influence of those simply beautiful and timeless hymns. So much so that now, 60 years later, I use the words that they sang as the words to my prayers. If you've noticed that, I, I use hymn prayers. And I think it started all the way back then because those words have stayed with me all my life. The beautiful hymns of our faith. So you can imagine my surprise and shock when Reverend Susan Kent, our pastor of worship, came into my office some months ago and said, we want to do a summer series on songs of a lifetime, hymns of our faith. And I looked at her and I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> Pardon the pun, it was music to my ears. <laughs> I said, you want to do a summer series on hymns? Yes. On the songs of a lifetime? Yes. And I could hardly contain myself. I started looking around, said, where's the camera? Where's the camera? Am I on candid camera? But it was no joke. And so today, we begin our summer series on this Father's Day with a song so many of us grew up singing and hearing. And each week, I, along with the other pastors of the church, will take a hymn and share with you something of the story and the inspiration that lies behind that hymn. And our prayer is that you will uh, not only be informed, but be enlightened, and that you will never sing these songs again the way that you once did. The hymn that I want to start out with this morning is one that I've been wanting to do for a long time. It's often been called the National Anthem of Southern Gospel Music and is called Victory in Jesus. And you know what I'm talking about. Let us pray.
name was Eugene Monroe Bartlett Sr. He was born on December the 24th, 1885 in Waynesville, Missouri. While still very young, his family moved to Sebastian County, Arkansas. He later attended the Hall Moody Institute in Martin, Tennessee and graduated from William Jewell College in Liberty, Missouri. Eugene Bartlett was a legendary name in Southern gospel music. Music was his life. Not only is he credited with writing hundreds of songs, but he revised an old method of teaching worshipers how to read a song by using shape notes, S-H-A-P-E, shape notes. Now, I'm not the brightest candle in the room when it comes to trying to explain anything that has to do with music. I wasn't in that line when God gave out gifts. I wasn't in the line of music. But anyway, Bartlett reintroduced the uh, shapes to assign these shapes for eight tones on the eight-tone scale, thus making it easier for the common person to read music. Consequently, if you open up some old song books, you will see triangles and diamonds and, and half moons and other symbols uh, dotting the music scores on the pages. He took something old and turned it into something new for his generation. He taught singing in singing schools throughout the South and founded the Hartford Music Institute where he taught voice and piano, piano tuning, harmony, and stringed instruments to students all over the South. He even opened an office in Nacogdoches, Texas, and in Hawthorne, Oklahoma. And one of his students was Albert Brumley, who, was, who later wrote the song, I'll Fly Away. Bartlett brought gospel music into churches both large and small. And he had a successful career doing what he loved. But in 1939, all of that changed. When he was 54, something happened to him that would forever change his life. Bartlett suffered a serious stroke that paralyzed him tragically bringing to an end his music career. No more could he travel and encourage churches in their singing. No longer could he do the one thing that he loved doing more than anything else, which was teaching students. He was confined to his bedroom with limited mobility, and it is written that the only consolation he had was reading his Bible. Friends said that he spent many hours of every day with his Bible in his hand, reading it until he fell asleep. And even though making music had come to an abrupt end, Eugene Bartlett, in his mind, he knew that he had one last song. One song stirring inside of him that would not let him go, that he needed to get out. So laboriously, painstakingly, he struggled to put pen to paper. And finally, finally, he put the words together to his final song, his last song, and it happened to be victory in Jesus it is a song filled with hope and joyfulness, finding its inspiration in the scriptures that Bartlett read each day. And sadly, not long after he wrote the hymn, Bartlett passed away at the age of 56 and was buried in Salon Springs, Arkansas. He was posthumously inducted into the Gospel Music Hall of Fame in Nashville in 1973. And his last song, Victory in Jesus, 
lives on in the hearts and in the voices of countless thousands. When I was a bishop in Oklahoma, one of the things that stands out in my memory is that in almost all of the smaller churches and a few large churches as well, we sang victory in Jesus almost always in at least 60% of the worship services I participated in, we sang that song, and, and I would often have fun with the pastors and the pianists of those congregations of accusing them of having a one-page hymnal. A one-page hymnal. And on that one page was the song, Victory in Jesus. To this day, I believe that they believe that if they didn't sing that song, their worship would be incomplete. Never mind, preacher, we did it last week. We're going to do it next week too. Ah, victory in Jesus. In fact, I, I privately asked a pastor who was right outside of McAllister one Sunday morning, why your church, why do your church do this song so often? And he sort of looked around and made sure nobody was listening, and he said, Bishop, if we didn't sing that song as often as we do, I'd be looking for another church and you would have another appointment to make. <laughs> that sounded like a threat to me. <laughs> anyway, one last song. Well, you need to know that this sermon this morning is not so much about Eugene Bartlett and his famous hymn as it is about us. Because as I was preparing this message, uh, the question came, kept coming back to me. And, and, and I have to ask you the same question that has been plaguing me these last two or three weeks. I know that we are not musicians in here, not all of us, but let me ask this question. If you had one last song before you ended this life, what would be the words to your song. Or if, if you just had a few words to leave as a testimony to your life, what would be the words that you would pass on to those who will remember you? What, what would they be? Would it be an affirmation of your faith? Or would it be a complaint against God? Would it be a chorus filled with thanksgiving or filled with regrets? When I think of how the quality of life of Eugene Bartlett declined and somehow he was able to, to write a song of inspiration in the dark days of his life, it humbles me. It does. How can it be that as he stood at death's door, he was somehow able to write about victory? That's the real mystery behind this hymn, and that's the message that he left for all of us to hear in the words of this song. There are several scriptures, they say, that went into the writing of this hymn, and, and one of those scriptures that Bartlett read that produced his memorable hymn came from 1 John 5 and 4. This is what it says, for whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Whatever conquers the world. This is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. So the epitaph that sums up Eugene Bartlett's life is this. His belief was so strong that paralysis, being paralyzed, confined, and even in declining health could not touch his faith. It was through faith in Christ that he could claim his victory over all the difficulties he faced. And he has given us this gift to explore the strength of our faith and the convictions of our souls. Jim Moore, the former pastor of St. Luke's United Methodist Church in Houston, 
who happens to be a very good friend of mine, a, a, a great author, great writer. Uh, he's written many books, and you're probably familiar with many of them. But one of his books stands out for me, and the book is called At the End of the Day, subtitled, How Will You Be Remembered? At the end of the day, how will you be remembered? In one of the chapters, he talks about how some of the most moving and powerful expressions of faith are found in our hymns, especially in our gospels and spirituals. In these songs, he, we find the hope of resurrection, a song, a strong belief that death is victory, that death is not death at all. It's going home to be with God. For people of faith, he says, death is a victorious home going. No doubt we've all heard those words expressed before, but this is what captured my attention to this particular part of his book. It is here that this sentence draws me to it. Listen, he says, we don't have to wait till we die to gain the victory. Eternal life can begin for you and me right now. Resurrection can happen for you and me in this moment. We do not have to wait until we physically die to go home with God. And then Jim Moore asks these questions. Do you feel trapped right now? Do you feel imprisoned, paralyzed, shackled, or buried by some problem? Is there something in your life right now that is sapping your strength, depleting your energy, destroying your soul? Is it some weakness? Is it an addiction? Is it emptiness within? Is it remorse over some wrong that you have done or something you have failed to do? And he concludes by saying, if so, there is good news. God has a resurrection for you. There is victory awaiting you, and his name is Jesus. It's Jesus. Oh, I, I love the, the medley these, these men sang today. Because it's all about Jesus. And that's what this sermon is about, all about Jesus. As my grandson Elijah would say, that's what I'm talking about. That, that's what I'm talking about. To someone five, six, or seven years old who may leave this church today and somebody said, what was church about today? It just thrills me when someone says, it's about Jesus. That's what it always is supposed to be about. He says, there's a resurrection for you, a victory awaiting you. His name is Jesus. And, and what Moore is saying and what Eugene Bartlett is saying is that unless we die unto those things that hold us down, that separate us from living the abundant life that Jesus talks about, we cannot be resurrected in this life into a fuller life. So you see, at the end of the day, and I'm going to make it real simple. Eugene Bartlett knew Jesus. <laughs> I'm getting it now. He, because he knew him, now I'm beginning to understand how Bartlett was able to write. I've heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, and how he made the lame to walk and Cause the blind to see, and then, this is this part, then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit, and somehow Jesus came to me and brought to me the victory. I, I get it now. It took me preparing this sermon to get it, how, why he was able to, to pull it all together at the very end of his life, because he knew one he called upon. Over the course of my ministry, I have had to have a lot of difficult meetings. Meetings about employment and human relations and all kinds of things with families and all of that. And in Oklahoma, my cabinet, the, the people who were my assistants knew that whenever I had a difficult meeting, I always called it a come to Jesus meeting. Bishop, you got a meeting? Yes. What kind of meeting is it? It's a come to Jesus meeting. 
is when we would sit down and the first thing we would do is to invite Jesus into the room to fill that space up because you see, without him being there, we, we were hopelessly unable. We would be unable to come to some resolution. So it was always a come to Jesus. Let's go to Jesus first and then we'll talk about the problem. And the reason I share that with you is because some of us need to come to Jesus. Some of us, as Bartlett said, we need to cry out, dear Jesus, come and heal whatever it is that separates me from you. It's an anthem of faith. It's a song of hope. It's the joy of real life in the here and now and the promise of the resurrection in the future. And one other scripture that Bartlett used to tie this all together, therefore, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The, sting? the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He knew him, and he knew what he could do for him. Canadian scientist G.B. Hardy states this. I have but two questions for religion. A scientist, two questions for religion. First, Did anybody ever conquer death? And second, did he make a way for me to do it? Did anybody ever conquer death? And did he make a way for me to do it? And the answer to both of those questions is a resounding yes, yes, yes in his name. Is Jesus. On April the 18th, 18, 1968, the London Bridge, you, you, you've heard the London Bridge falling down. Well, the London Bridge was brought by Robert McCullough, a Missouri oil entrepreneur. It cost him $7 million to disassemble the London Bridge in England and reassemble it in Lake Havasu City, Arizona. Stone by stone into 10,246 numbered pieces, it was put together half a world away from the Atlantic Ocean. The Golden Gate Bridge which spans the entrance to San Francisco Bay is 6,450 feet in length and it cost $35 million to build, which was a lot of money when it was completed in May of 1937. The San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge, also called the Bay Bridge, is eight and one-fourth miles long, the world's longest bridge. It cost $7.2 million and was completed in 1936, just a few months before the San Francisco Bridge. George Washington Memorial Bridge is the third longest suspension bridge in the world, spanning the Hudson River between Fort Lee, New Jersey, and New York City. It opened in 1931 at a cost of $60 million. The reason I share with you all the history of all these bridges is because I want to make you aware today that there is another bridge. It's the costliest bridge in all of human history. And it is not made with bricks nor mortar. It is made of the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. And this bridge that I'm talking about spans the awful chasm between sinful humanity and a holy God. It cost God everything to build this bridge between him and us. And it says in John 3, God so loved us that he was willing not only to give, but he built this bridge between him and us. And this bridge doesn't look like any ordinary bridge. I'll tell you how it looks. It looks like that. 
It's the bridge that binds us to God. And it is God's Son, Jesus Christ, who has claimed the victory over that bridge, that cross. And all he asks of us today is to pick it up and follow him, claim it, own it, make it yours. For little do you know it, the victory has already been won. Faith is stronger than fear, and the power of the resurrection is stronger than death. And so, when you cry out, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit, somehow, some way, Jesus will come to you and claim the victory in your life. That's what I believe. That, that's what I know. I know to be true because he has come to my life countless hundreds, thousands of times and reminded me of the victory. After my prayer, guess what song I'm going to ask you to sing? <laughs> and I hope, I hope that you will help us to sing it in a way that you've never done before. Because if you know Jesus, if you know Jesus through your faith, you can conquer the world. Let us pray. Thank you, Jesus, for this tremendous victory of life in its abundance. Thank you for this victory of life over death. Thank you for loving us ere we even knew it. Thank you for Eugene Bartlett and the gift that you gave him in the shadows of his life so that we can sing it in a way that adds meaning not only to what he tried to teach us, but try to implore us in the way that we should live. Thank you, Jesus, because it's all about you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let the church say,